people here today. So, um, first, thank you for staying. What was that, everybody? So I have a serious question for you. If there was something wrong with your car and you took it to a mechanic, and the mechanic looked at it for about an hour and then said, I know exactly what's wrong, I've diagnosed your car. And here's the good news. I have 40 or 50 different options for how I can solve this problem. Here's the bad news. I don't know which one's gonna work. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna try one, but the problem is this. It has about a 30% chance of working. It has about a 40 or 50% chance of making things worse. So I'm gonna do just a little bit of it, and you're gonna drive it home and you're going to drive it around for a few weeks, and you're going to come back and you're going to tell me how you're doing. And if it just completely breaks down on the highway, give me a call, because that's no good. So, who would do that? Nobody would. Of course, it's ridiculous. Nobody treats their car that way. So say you take your daughter or your mom to the doctor, and you say, she's been struggling, she's been having problems. The doctor spends some time with her, and comes back and says, I know exactly what's wrong. She's suffering from major depression. Good news. I have 40 or 50 different things I can do to solve this problem. I have lots of different medication choices. Here's the bad news. I don't know which one's going to work. And here's what's going to happen. There's a 40 or 50 percent chance that I'm going to make it worse. So we're going to start this really slow because there's only about a 30 percent chance that I'm actually going to get it right. So we're going to start slow. You're going to go home with her. We're going to see what happens. If, God forbid, she starts having suicide ideation, you're gonna call me right away. Otherwise, you're gonna come back in three weeks, and in the perfect world, I found the right one by accident. True. <laughs> but I'm not gonna have given her enough, so I'm gonna titrate her up, I'm gonna actually give her a little bit more, and we're gonna do this for you know a couple of months, and we're gonna see what happens. So, obviously, you wouldn't wanna treat your daughter or your mom that way, and clearly you wouldn't treat your car the way the other story went. But here's the problem. You don't have any choice when you're talking about severe depression right now. Because that's pretty much what happens. So 50 million Americans suffer from depression and related conditions. 500 million prescriptions a year. There are 320 million people in the United States. 500 million prescriptions a year. One in four lifetime prevalence. So, one in four lifetime prevalence, one in five annual prevalence. Every person in this room either is on one of these medications, has a family member, member on one of these medications, or has a friend on one of these medications. I'm on one of these medications. 50 to 70% failure rates. 70% of the time, people fail on these medications. Even worse. 40,000 suicides a year in the United States. That's one every 13 minutes. One every 13 minutes. That means somebody in the United States killed themselves while Nick and I were talking tonight. It's awful. It's even worse with military families. It's, um, and 40 to 50 ER visits a week. That's 40 to 50 ER visits a week at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. One hospital, one children's hospital. 40 to 50 ER visits a week for attempted suicide. So why is this? Why do we uh, why do we let this continue? Is it because we don't care about these diseases and these people? Is it because of stigma? Is it because of not understanding? Is it because of myths? Well, actually, when I built this slide, I thought I should change my whole talk and actually just talk about stigma and myths and attitudes toward uh, mental health. But it's too late. I already written it. So, <laughs> and Jamie kept bugging me for slides. And, you know, so, um, so, no, of course it's not why. And, and do these drugs not work? Do the doctors not know what they're doing? Um, none of that's true. Actually, the drugs work pretty well. Like I said, they have um, many, many, many choices. And psychiatrists and other doctors, of course, know what they're doing. Um, they are extremely good at diagnosing these diseases, but what they don't have is, a, is an objective test, a way to figure out which of these medications will actually work for the patients. So, 
this is a very complicated slide, and the good news is this is the point of my talk. Well, it is the point of my talk, but I'm going to spend a lot of time on this slide. So this is combinatorial pharmacogenetics. We attest later. <laughs> so what does that mean? Well, so for decades, scientists have been trying to figure out why if you get the right patient matched up with the right drug, it actually works. But we still fail 70% of the time of doing that. And they figured it has to have something to do with your DNA, it has to have something to do with genetics. And so dozens and hundreds of studies have been done all over the world. And some should promise, but never could they correlate what was going on and how to get people on the right medications until combinatorial pharmacogenomics or genetics. Almost all of these drugs pass through multiple pathways in your body. So the reason they couldn't find the correlation was you can't look at one gene and one drug and figure out which one's going to work for a patient. What you have to do is look at all of the genes that affect the metabolism of these drugs. And so what, what this slide is showing is oh, looking at a whole lot of genes, doing a whole lot of computation using advanced informatics and a lot of computing power, and then binning drugs into green, yellow, and red to show uh, which medications are going to work best for the patient. So that sounds great, looks great. Um, looks really complicated though, it's really hard to do, and something that probably the average person, even the average doctor, is not going to understand. So, not very useful. So what do you need to do with these types of technologies? You need to make them simple, fast, and you need to make them accessible and actionable. So, how can we do that? What if a doctor could decide that you needed a medication, could have you swab yourself with a cheek swab, which is basically just a sterile Q-tip, Take that Q-tip, put it in a FedEx envelope, send it to a lab, have that lab do all of that advanced stuff that was on the previous slide, and the next day, give them a report on their iPad or their iPhone that tells them which medications are more likely to work for that patient. That would be fantastic. So how do we get there? How do we, how do we get to this future? Well, the future is now. So there have been uh, over 125,000 patients tested using this technology. Uh, that is a fraction of the 50 million I talked about before, but still 125,000 patients is a lot of patients. And met most of those patients, many of those patients have had their lives restored. So let's talk about that a little bit. So I always tell people, your life's work should be something that doesn't embarrass your mom. <laughs> so, even, even better, if she brags about you to all of her friends, right? So I'm lucky enough, what do I do for a living? I'm lucky enough to work for a company in Mason, Ohio, um, that uses technology that came from Cincinnati Children's uh, Medical Center and the Mayo Clinic, and now things that uh, have been developed uh, right here in town. And every day, what I get to do is work for a company that is changing people's lives. So um, I'll tell you a few stories about that. So um, these are all true stories. 40-year-old uh, um, CEO of a Fortune 500 company uh, has been struggling with depression for years. Um, finally has a break, has a psychotic break. It's not a good thing. And, um, ends up losing his job and losing his wife and, uh, and ended up in a clinic. He got the test. He uh, went from being on seven medications to two medications, neither of which were ones that he was on before. And six months later, back with his wife and, um, and working again. 65-year-old man, I actually talked to this person, 65-year-old man called up and said that he had not had a coherent conversation with his wife in two years. Um, she was on 12 of these psychotropic medications, which is not as abnormal as, uh, as you may think, or unusual as you may think, although it's absurd because you 
can't be on 12 of these medications and have it work. 12 medications, doctor um, had finally given up. They, uh, they did the test, took her off of 10 of those medications, left her on two of them, and six months later, she and he were on their way uh, to a vacation in Hawaii, and he wanted us to know that. Um, and then, The, um, a doctor, a, a psychiatrist called us, um, was um, Giddy, which doesn't happen a lot with psychiatrists. <laughs> and, uh, but he wanted us to know that he had 19 year old patients, like a man who had been working with for a few years, and um, he had, had tried many, many, many different uh, medications with this patient. And he was calling that day to tell us that he had gotten the test, he had changed his medication. And that day in his office, he saw that 19-year-old man smile for the first time since he met him. So 50 million people, these are all people, not patients, they're people. Uh, 500 million strips, 40,000 suicides a year in the United States, 70% failure rate on the medications. So what can we do about this? Well, one thing we can do about it is personalized medicine. Help